I ended the last lecture by telling you how molecules of chlorophyll found in what are called photosystems in the membranes of chloroplasts can not only absorb the energy of a photon of light, but more importantly, how they can capture this energy by having an electron removed from an excited chlorophyll molecule and transferred to what we called the primary electron acceptor molecule of that photosystem. Now, in today's lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of photosynthesis, the process by which green plants and other photosynthetic organisms make sugar out of sunlight. Before we go on, however, I want to briefly remind you what's at stake here. That is, what the point of this whole process is. To do that, I'm going to go back to a very old experiment, one done about 300 years ago by a Belgian doctor named Jan Baptiste von Helmen. The, um, uh, von Helmont lived in the, uh, uh, worked in the first half of the 17th century, and he was interested in the question of where plants get their food. In other words, where do plants get the stuff that they use to build more of themselves, that they use to grow? Now, one obvious possibility, one that had been suggested by the ancient Greeks long ago, was that plants actually obtain the stuff they're made out of by taking it up from the soil through their roots. Interestingly, this idea had never really been directly uh, tested until Van Helmont got to it. Now, Van Helmont's test was actually very simple and elegant. He planted a small tree in a pot of soil after carefully weighing both the tree and the soil that he put into that container. Then Van Helmont carefully watched the growth of this tree over a several year period, except, uh, making sure that nothing but water was added to the container in which the tree was growing. After five years, Van Helmont dug up the tree and then again carefully weighed the tree and the soil that was remaining in the container. So in other words, he started with a bunch of soil, the tree grew, he ended up asking how much did the tree grow by weight and how much soil was left. He found that the tree, not surprisingly, had gained an enormous amount of mass, about 75 kilograms. But the soil in the container weighed only about 50 or 60 grams less than it was when he first put it in there five years earlier. Now, Van Helmont correctly concluded from this experiment that whatever substance the plant was building itself out of could not have come from the soil. There simply wasn't enough material lost from the soil to account for the enormous growth of the plant. It had to come from someplace else. Now, Van Helmont got the answer a little bit wrong at this point because he suggested that maybe where the substance of the plant came from was from the water that he had added to the container because he had added a lot of water over that five-year period. And that's not where it comes from at all. Now, Van Helmont really can't be blamed for making this mistake because at the time he lived, there wasn't really known about the biochemistry of living things to see how his conclusion must be an error. Like any living organism, what the tree is mostly made of are carbon-based organic compounds. In other words, what the tree needs is a supply of carbon to build these compounds. We know now that where plants and photosynthetic organisms get this carbon is from carbon dioxide. If it's a terrestrial plant, it gets this from the carbon dioxide that's found in the atmosphere. If it's um, an algae or a plant that's living in water, it might get it from the carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the water. Here's the interesting point. Ultimately, all of the carbon that is found in all living things on the planet, all of it, originally comes into living systems in the form of CO2 that is taken up by photosynthetic organisms. Now, remember that CO2 is the most oxidized and therefore the lowest energy form of carbon around. So the trick that photosynthetic organisms must be able to accomplish is not only to acquire this carbon from the atmosphere or from water if they're aquatic plants, but more importantly to reduce this carbon. Right? To, to add energy to this carbon, to use that added energy to build this relatively oxidized form of carbon, CO2, into reduced high energy carbons found in organic molecules such as sugar. This point then takes us back to where we left off last time. We saw how chlorophyll molecules occurring in tight, highly organized bunches can capture the energy they absorb from photons of light by passing this energy amongst themselves like a hot potato until finally an excited electron is transferred by a redox reaction to what we call a primary electron acceptor molecule.
This is a redox reaction, which means when it occurs, an electron is actually taken away from a chlorophyll molecule and taken up by this primary acceptor molecule. Now that primary acceptor molecule has taken the energy originally coming into the system in terms of photons of energy, packets of light energy, and been able to store this energy in the, con or store this energy in the form of a captured electron. The next step is to figure out how this captured energy can be turned into a form that can be used by plants to build these high energy organic compounds. Well, to understand this, first let me remind you, as we said last time, that photosynthesis can be divided into two functionally distinct processes. The so-called light reactions are the part of the process that takes the energy stored in this captured electron we've just discussed and converts it to more usable forms of energy, forms of energy that the plant can then use in what we call the dark reactions to actually build high energy organic compounds such as sugars. Let's take a look first at how the light reactions work. Now, in brief, the way the chloroplast converts some of the energy stored in the electron that's been captured by this primary electron uh, acceptor is similar to what we saw earlier um, in the way that mitochondria are able to use energy stored in electrons uh, in the process of cellular respiration. Specifically, immediately after the primary electron receptor molecule of a photosystem has picked up an extra electron, it transfer this, transfers this electron to an electron transport chain. This electron transport chain is embedded in the chloroplast membrane, in the innermost membrane that we call the thylakoid membrane. Now, the electron transport chain that occurs in thylakoid membranes includes actually molecules that are very similar to the kinds we looked at when we looked at electron transport in the context of cellular respiration. The specific molecules are different, but from our point of view, what's happening is essentially the same thing. This high energy electron is passed from one molecule to the next along this electron transport chain, essentially stepping it down in energy. Now, as that energy of, as the energy of the electron is stepped down through these subsequent um, redox reactions, the energy that's released, just as we saw in cellular respiration, is used to pump hydrogen ions across that thylakoid membrane. Specifically, what happens is that this energy is used to pump hydrogen ions from the, the, the large inner chamber of the uh, chloroplast, what we called the stroma last time, into the space on the inside of those thylakoids, the, the thylakoid space. Now, the, the geometry doesn't matter all that much, but the point is, is that what we're doing, again, is creating a concentration gradient of hydrogen ions using the energy released by the redox reactions of an electron transport chain to do the pumping uphill necessary to create that concentration gradient. And then just as we saw in cellular respiration, that concentration gradient that's generated this way is used to drive the production of ATP from ADP through the action of the enzyme ATP synthase. Remember, ATP synthase is that really, really complex and interesting um, uh, enzyme complex which uh, serves as a channel, a kind of ion channel or pore, which allows the hydrogen ions to run down their concentration gradient, in this case from the inside of the thylakoid space, from the thylakoid space into the stroma, running down their concentration gradient through this enzyme, and in so doing, the movement of hydrogen ions somehow causes a translational movement of this enzyme, which you'll recall effectively ends up um, uh, phosphorylating ADP and making more ATP. Now the point is, as we said, it's sort of like a water wheel. We've got energy that's been stored in this concentration gradient that drives um, the production of more ATP through the action of the enzyme ATP synthase. It's very similar to what we saw uh, when we were talking about cellular respiration, a chemiosmotic process driving the generation of more ATP. Now in this case, Remember back then we referred to that process as oxidative phosphorylation because ultimately it was the oxidation of glucose that provided the electrons that drove that electron transport chain and thus generated um, uh, more ATP. In this case, in photosynthesis, we refer to the process as photophosphorylation. We call it photophosphorylation because ultimately the energy here is coming from sunlight. It's coming from that energy that was absorbed from photons of light 
impinging on the photosystem. Okay, so now we've got this electron that has been excited by photons, passed on to a primary electron receptor, and then passed down an electron transport chain. And in so doing, we've gotten that uh, change in the energy level of the electron to generate some more ATP for us through chemiosmosis. Now, the next question we need to ask is where does that electron that gets passed down the electron transport chain eventually end up? Remember in cellular respiration, in oxidative phosphorylation, we saw that where that en electron ended up was with an oxygen atom. The oxygen was the ultimate electron receptor, and then when oxygen accepted that electron, it quickly formed a molecule of water. The fate of electrons moving through the electron transport chain in the light reactions of photosynthesis is very, very different from this. And understanding how it's different will, different will give us some insight into understanding how these light reactions work. In fact, there are two possible fates for the electrons that are captured from chlorophyll molecules. These two fates represent really two ways in which the light, light reactions can work. Now, these two versions of the light reactions are referred to, and I'll just name these for you now, and then I'll explain them. They're referred to as cyclic electron transport versus non-cyclic electron transport. Now, cyclic electron transport represents the evolutionarily more ancient photosynthetic process, um, whereas non-cyclic electron transport is evolutionarily more is a, it represents a, a more recent evolutionary innovation in photosynthetic pathways. Let's look at these two processes in turn. In cyclic electron transport, the electron that was originally captured from a chlorophyll molecule in a photosystem is eventually passed back to that same photosystem. In other words, what happens is that as that electron moves through the electron transport chain through successive redox reactions, it ends up at its lowest energy state being passed right back to a chlorophyll molecule in the photosystem from which it was taken. That's why we call it cyclic electron transport, because electrons really are just cycling in and out of these photosystems, and as they're cycling through, they generate some ATP through chemiosmosis. Now, by contrast, in non-cyclic electron transport, the electron that was originally captured from a chlorophyll molecule in a photosystem eventually is passed on to another electron shuttle molecule, a different molecule that takes that electron and does something else to it. Now, the name of this molecule is nicotinamide adenine, uh, uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. Mercifully, we can just call this NADP for short. Now, NADP is another one of these electron carrier molecules, just like the NAD and FAD that we looked at uh, when we were talking about cellular respiration. It's a molecule that can accept electrons with the help of a dehydrogenase e enzyme and thus become reduced, basically adding electrons to it. And then the reduced form of this electron carrier can take those electrons someplace else. So what this means is that in non-cyclic electron transport, not only do we gain energy in the form of ATP produced through chemiosmosis as that electron steps down an electron transport chain, but then the captured electron is, then at, is not put back in the photosystem. It's taken someplace else. It's used to reduce an electron carrier molecule. Now what we'll see is that the ATP that's produced by chemiosmosis in this light reaction and this reduced electron carrier molecule both will provide energy to power the reactions of the Calvin cycle, or the dark reactions of photosynthesis. Let's take a look um, uh, at non-cyclic electron transport a little more closely to see if we can understand it. Actually, non-cyclic electron transport requires two different kinds of photosystems. Now, these photosystems uh, differ in terms of the nature of their primary electron receptor molecule and a few other molecular details. So they're different kinds of photosystems. We call them photosystem one and photosystem two. Those names, although simple, are somewhat counterintuitive because it turns out that photosystem two really functionally comes before photosystem one uh, in terms of the way that we look at the pathway, the movement of an electron through these photosystems. Uh, they're named one and two because that reflects the historical uh, order in which they were discovered. Now let's follow the path of an electron in non-cyclic um, electron transport as a way of summarizing the key points of how the light reactions of photosynthesis works. All right, as I've said a couple of times, photons of light will excite 
uh, electrons in chlorophyll molecules of a photosystem. In this case, we're starting with photosystem 2. One of those excited electrons might be captured by the primary acceptor molecule of that photosystem, in which case that electron is passed on to an electron transport chain and through a series of redox reactions moves down, uh, steps down energy levels and eventually, and in so doing, produces some ATP. Now, where this electron goes at the end of the electron transport chain is to a different kind of photosystem what we call photosystem one. That's one comes after two in terms of thinking about the, the order in which, the, the, the path in which these electrons are moving through these photosystems. So we have an electron captured from photosystem two, taken up by an electron transport chain, stepped down its energy level, and then ending up eventually in a chlorophyll molecule in photosystem one, a different kind of photosystem. In the meantime, photosystem one actually also is being excited by photons of light. So photosystem one is also losing electrons to its own primary electron receptor. Now, when a, photos, when a photosystem one primary uh, electron acceptor molecule captures an electron, what it does with the electron is very different. It doesn't pass it on to an electron transport chain, but instead, via a short set of intermediates, passes it on to this electron carrier molecule that we called NADP. All right, reducing it to become what we would call NADPH. Now, let's keep track of our electrons here. We've, we've lost an electron from photosystem two. We've taken that electron down an electron transport chain. It now ends up in photosystem one. We had lost an electron from photosystem one. That's the electron that ended up in our electron carrier. Now, photosystem one is even when it comes to electrons, right? It lost an electron to the electron carrier, but it gained an electron from the one that was lost from photosystem two. Photosystem two, however, is missing an electron. Where does it get electrons to fill what's essentially a hole in that photosystem? Ultimately, the electrons that will come and fill the hole, the electron hole in photosystem two, come from water. What happens is that the chlorophyll molecules, the oxidized chlorophyll molecules in that photosystem, turn out to be very highly attractive to, to electrons. They're highly electronegative. And then with the aid of an enzyme, these, um, these oxidized chlorophylls in the photosystem will pull electrons out of a water molecule. When they pull this electron out of the mo water molecule, what we find is that water molecule breaks up and we end up with oxygen, oxygen gas, as essentially a byproduct. So let's uh, summarize where we are here. Now we've seen how electrons move through these two photosystems in what we call non-cyclic electron transport. It turns out that for every two electrons that move through, we will reduce one electron carrier, NADPH, completely. We've captured some energy in the form of ATP because of electron transport, and we've also captured some energy in the form of this reduced electron carrier molecule. Now, before we go on and look at the Kelvin cycle, in other words, what this energy accomplishes later. I want to go back again for a second and just look at what we called cyclic electron transport. Now, remember in cyclic electron transport, what happens is that the electron ends up going back into the photosystem from whence it came. Essentially, cyclic electron transport happens as sort of a short circuit. If there is no electron carrier molecule, no oxidized NADP, available to pick up electrons that are elevated to, or that are, that are transferred to the electron acceptor molecule of photosystem one. Instead, what will happen to those electrons is they'll take a slightly different pathway through a set of different redox reactions, and this is how they get passed into the electron transport chain. So photosystem one is doing cyclic non, uh, or cyclic um, electron transport if there isn't NADP available to take those electrons that get avail uh, elevated out of that photosystem. Now, on its own, cyclic electron flow doesn't really produce much energy because it only produces some ATP through the action of the electron transport chain. 
but it does produce some ATP and it essentially does it for free because what is powering the production of that ATP is simply the energy absorbed from sunlight and you'll remember we said that for all intents and purposes at the moment at least the energy from sunlight is essentially an unlimited resource as long as the sun is shining you can get as much energy as you want now you would think then that plants having evolved this cyclic electron transport would be doing well enough they can make ATP that's what they need to power the 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 engines of their cells but it turns out that ATP although it's a useful energy currency doesn't store well it doesn't have a very good shelf life in the cell that's why it's very useful for photosynthetic organisms to take some of the energy that they're capturing when they're capturing this energy from sunlight and not use it to immediately produce ATP, but instead use it to produce a way, uh, uh, essentially a storage form of high energy, which would be an organic compound such as sugar. And that brings us then to the reactions of the Calvin cycle, which are the reactions that accomplish this end. What the Calvin cycle does simply is to use that energy that's been captured from the light reactions and stored in the form of some ATP and some NADPH, the reduced electron carrier molecule, and use that energy to reduce carbon and thus be able to build organic molecules, especially high energy sugars. Now, as with the other metabolic pathways that we've discussed over the last several lectures, the reactions of the Calvin cycle, the specifics of them, can be really quite complicated, and we're not interested in looking at those specific reactions in detail. Instead, what we want to do is just understand the general principles by which carbon, which is occurring in its low energy form of CO2, gets um, transformed into a reduced high energy form in complex organic molecules. As its name suggests, the Calvin cycle is a metabolic cycle, similar to the way that what we talked about a couple of lectures ago with the Krebs cycle is a metabolic cycle. In other words, the intermediates, the chemical intermediates, the compounds in this cycle, cycle back on each other and keep reforming themselves. Now what happens along the way is that some carbon gets added to some of these compounds, picked up in the form of CO2, and thus incorporated into a higher energy, more reduced form. And then later on in the cycle, parts of this high energy reduced form of carbon can leave that cycle. Now, before we look at this process, I want to just contrast that in general with what we saw with the Krebs cycle. Remember, in the Krebs cycle, that metabolic cycle, we saw how high energy reduced carbon gets put into the cycle. Remember, it got put into the cycle in the form of those two carbon acetyl CoA molecules combining with a four carbon molecule to form a six carbon molecule, which then en essentially energetically stepped down and eventually um, would release as a waste product the oxidized uh, form of car uh, carbon in the form of CO2. Now, by contrast, the Calvin cycle does just the reverse. The oxidized form of carbon, CO2, gets put into this cycle. And then what comes out of this cycle is a higher energy carbon compound. So we have sort of a general reversal of how these cycles are putting in and taking out carbon. Krebs cycle takes in high energy carbon, puts out low energy carbon, making some energy for us in the form of ATP and reduced uh, electron carriers. Whereas the Calvin cycle does the opposite. It takes in low energy carbon and puts out higher en energy carbon. And to do so, we need to add energy to the cycle in the form of ATP. And again, a reduced electron carrier molecule. Now let's look at the Calvin cycle in just a little bit de uh, more detail. Now the first thing I want to point out is that we've been talking about the Calvin cycle, the dark reactions of photosynthesis, as essentially making sugars. And we've been talking about glucose as being kind of our, our, primal, uh, our primary um, uh, sugar molecule throughout our discussions of energy in cells. It turns out that glucose isn't directly produced by the Calvin cycle. Instead, the molecule that is produced by the Calvin cycle is a three-carbon sugar, not a six-carbon sugar. This three-carbon sugar is called glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate, or G3P for short. Now, you might remember that we've run into this molecule, G3P, before. This is the same three-carbon compound that's produced by the splitting of glucose in glycolysis, 
which is occurring at essentially the highest energy part of the glycolytic pathway. After we've invested some energy to break up glucose, we're en we end up with a couple of high energy carbon compounds, and those were G3P. So the same molecule that is, that, that is the, the uh, first three carbon sugar to appear in glycolysis is the molecule that is produced directly by the reactions of the Calvin cycle. Now the Calvin cycle can be divided into three functional phases. The entire cycle, by the way, essentially runs uphill energetically. In other words, all of these reactions are largely endergonic, which is why we need to add energy to make them run. This shouldn't be surprising to us because what we're doing is building more complex higher, uh, higher energy molecules out of simpler lower energy ones. Now in the first phase of the Calvin cycle, a new carbon atom, one carbon atom enters the cycle as a molecule of CO2, and it does this by combining with a five carbon um, molecule called ribulose bisphosphate. Ribulose bisphosphate, lots of these names. We could call this RUBP for short. It's a, it's a molecule worth uh, remembering because ribulose bis bisphosphate is the acceptor for carbon in what we call carbon fixation. In other words, this step the, the combination of carbon dioxide with ribulose bisphosphate, bisphosphate, RUBP, is the way that carbon gets into all living systems. This reaction is, is catalyzed by an enzyme called ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase. And in fact, we can just simply, or carboxylate, I should say, and we can just call that Rubisco for short. Now, Rubisco also is a noteworthy enzyme because, in fact, this is the enzyme that is responsible for all carbon fixation on the planet. In fact, it's probably the most abundant enzyme that's occurring on the planet. Now, once we've got carbon in, in the form of creating a six carbon molecule by adding one carbon to this five carbon molecule, that six carbon molecule is very high energy, essentially unstable. It quickly splits into a couple of three carbon molecules, and then we go into what we would call the second phase or the reduction phase of the Kelvin cycle. Now all that's happening in the reduction phase is through a series of reactions we're now adding energy into these molecules in the form of ATP that donates its phosphates and also in the form of NADPH which donates its electrons. We're pumping these three carbon sugars up to even higher energy states. And at the end of the reduction phase we have a molecule of, we have several molecules actually of the um, three carbon sugar G3P. Now the final phase of the Calvin cycle is another set of reactions that basically has to regenerate that five carbon molecule. Now keeping track of the carbons here can be actually kind of complicated because you can imagine we have to add three carbons from CO2 molecules for every one three carbon G3P molecule that we get out of the system. It turns out that the accounting is quite complicated because at the end of this reduction phase, some of the G3P that's used will stay in the Calvin cycle. It will be substrates for further reactions in the Calvin cycle necessary for us to rearrange some molecules to make these five carbon sugars. That rearrangement also requires some energy, so this is another place where ATP has to be added to the Calvin cycle. We essentially get out one molecule of G3P for every five molecules that has to go back and cycle in to the Krebs cycle. But what we have gotten now for every three carbon dioxides on average that go into this uh, part of the um, cycle, the Calvin cycle, what we get out is a high energy three carbon sugar of G3P. Well, what have we accomplished with the Calvin cycle? As I said, we've put in three carbons in their most oxidized, lowest energy form, and we've gotten them out in terms of a very high energy, very reduced molecule of uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or G3P. Now, this G3P is then exported from the chloroplast, and it actually has itself two fates. Remember, G3P is the three-carbon molecule at the very high energy part of the glycolytic pathway. So one thing that might happen to this G3P is that it'll enter into the plant cell's own glycolytic pathway, and thus contribute to the production of even more ATP through the reactions that we've talked about of cellular respiration. Or the plant may use G3P as a building block for building other more complex carbon molecules such as glucose.
In other words, two molecules of G3P may combine and uh, form a molecule, a six carbon molecule of glucose. Glucose is a much more stable molecule and therefore it's a good storage molecule. Now, if we were to keep a tally sheet of energy, and I don't want to count this up in detail, we'd find that the amount of energy that a plant has to put into the Kelvin cycle to essentially produce the equivalent of one glucose molecule, two molecules of G3P, is actually a little bit more, roughly, than the amount of energy that it will get out of breaking down that glucose. Essentially, it's not a very efficient process, but it's a useful process because that energy is now stored in glucose. It can be used in all sorts of other processes now or later. Or, as we saw earlier, that glucose or other organic compounds produced by the plant can be essentially stolen from the plant when that plant is eaten by some heterotroph. What happens to that energy later on as it moves through other parts of biological systems is the subject we'll turn to in the next lecture.